So, uh, as I say, this is a kind of personal and historical perspective to some extent. Um, so perhaps this talk's going to be a little bit self-indulgent in that respect. Um, this is basically um, what I'm going to talk about. I want to kind of give a, a retrospective on how I see the field has developed in the time that I've been involved with it and indeed in the time uh, before um, before I, I came in in, the, in about 1990. Uh, I want to look a little bit at the, not in great detail, at the kind of perhaps slightly paradoxical history of, of automated and interactive theorem proving and also at the development of mathematical libraries and what motivates people to develop mathematical libraries. And as a, a case study of what I've talked about before, I'm going to talk about my own, um, more or less my latest sort of pure mathematical uh, little project, which has been formalizing the, the isoparametric theorem and talking about how that was a fit or was not a good fit for, for libraries. So wh wh why am I doing a retrospective? So I, I mean, I haven't been around in this field as long as uh, some of the real pioneers, but I, I did write my first formal proof in 1990. So I've been around a, a fair while, um, you know, three, three decades. And during most of the intervening time, I have been involved in some kind of theorem proving, either formalizing mathematics or implementing proof procedures or both of the above. Um, and what have I learned or what perspectives have I acquired from my three decades and also looking back historically to the time before I started? Well, perhaps I'm exaggerating a little, but I, I'm inclined to say, at least from the point of view of formalization, automation, the quality of automation in systems has certainly advanced, but in a way it's been incremental advances. I mean, very spectacular in some according to some numerical parameters. Um, but I'm not sure, given how much faster computers have gotten, how much general development there's been, that people who were active in the, uh, let's say, the mid-1970s in automating theorem proving would be you know, amazed at what we've accomplished. I think it's been, um, there's certainly been a lot of progress, but I'm inclined to put the advance of automation relatively low in terms of uh, important things that have changed. Um, in fact, I almost feel that a lot of these two dec uh, three decades have been making the conscious choice not to use automation, rather to use a degree of interactivity that also yields a higher uh, level of control. This perhaps is a bit of a programmer aesthetic versus a mathematician aesthetic. I think if, you, if you're a programmer by temperament, you tend to appreciate things that are predictable and controllable, even if it might come at the expense of, of power. What, what I think perhaps has changed more dramatically is rather the sheer amount of formal material that has been proved the sheer volume of libraries of formalized mathematics. So when I look back, I think if I imagine trying to do what I do now in 1990, I could very well imagine doing it with the level of automation that was common in the 1990s. Um, on the other hand, I would find it difficult to imagine doing it starting from what had been formalized in the 90s. In other words, simply the amount of background material that's been proved. I see that as being uh, absolutely um, a pretty dramatic difference. And, and then ironically, I think the amount of formalized mathematics that we've accumulated may finally itself lead to a kind of, well, I think it already is, and some of the talks in this conference are going to be about this kind of topic. Um, because all these large libraries of results that have been originally proved via human interaction can now be used as fodder for various learning techniques and might actually help to drive more automation in the future. So out of all the things that have changed in, in decades, I am inclined to 
put the development of libraries high. And it's not always something that you, you're you appreciated for in the academic setting. I think it's typically considered much more exciting to develop a new um, you know, decision procedure versus just plodding through doing a nice systematic development of, of basic uh, mathematical analysis or algebra or whatever it is. Um, but I think the cumulative effect of adding these libraries is actually quite, um, is possibly more dramatic. And I think there's a particular mix of motivations that have inspired people to develop the formal libraries of mathematics. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I see the various motivations playing in. And I think the best formal libraries typically have a, a mix of motivations. Very often they're originally motivated by some top level application that they want to support, but then they approach the task of constructing a library more, more systematically from the bottom up. At least this is my this is my claim. So I mean on automation and interaction, there's what on the face of it looks like a paradox in the history of, of theorem proving right in that automated theorem proving came first. If you look at all the first research papers on theorem proving, it's all about automated theorem proving. I mean, there were many different approaches. There were the more sort of AI, human-oriented approaches and the more machine-oriented approaches. But all of these were automated in the sense you were supposed to just present the machine with a challenge problem and it would prove it or more likely not prove it. Um, but it was essentially more of a kind of push button thing. Um, and if you look at the field in the 60s and 70s, there was a very rapid development of, in particular, the machine oriented style of this, you know, Robinson developed the resolution method, and various other first order methods using unification were developed. There's Knuth Bendix completion was quite influential on equational logic and, and first order reasoning. Uh, Boyer and Moore were automating uh, inductive theorem proving. And then independently, more or less, Shostak and Nelson Oppen were both working on cooperating decision procedures, mostly in the setting of program verification rather than pure mathematics per se. But um, in some sense, their work forms the core of what's now you know, SMT solve as a big, big, uh, a big component of the um, automated provers that are used in verification. So there was this surge of excitement around inter uh, automated proving, but then at some point after making very rapid progress, there was a sense that maybe things were beginning to plateau, perhaps because in some sense you're hitting, I mean, in some sense, automated theorem proving is is probably an exponential problem. Um, and so in some sense, you are likely to hit a point at which, um, you know, just doing things twice as fast, just being a bit cleverer here and there, um, even though it can bring new results um, in, it always has a tendency to, to plateau. And I think this led to a um, certain degree of pessimism, which maybe um, in particular, I think this this applied to, you know, AI generally in the 70s, there was sort of AI winter and, and so forth. But it also provided a renewed impetus for interactive theorem proving where humans would guide the proof. And you can certainly find early uh, work in interactive theorem provers, um, even um, Hao Wang, who wrote one of the very first automated theorem provers was already anticipating that maybe the long-term goal might be not that the computer would do all the work by magic, but rather that it would be a kind of more humble assistant that perhaps the human being would provide a, a proof outline. But even though he was, uh, and probably others were anticipating this, uh, there wasn't as much serious work in interactive theorem proving at that time. As I say, it seems very paradoxical. People started solving the more difficult problem and ignored the sort of apparently relatively easy problem of uh, just supporting a human being. But maybe in a way it wasn't an easier thing, particularly in the context of the computer systems at the time, which didn't, for technical reasons, didn't necessarily make interaction uh, very easy. 
And actually some of the, you know, just because you would be, you know, submitting your job on punched cards and it would be uh, executed overnight and you'd get the feedback the next day and so on, uh, it's rather difficult to have any productive interaction in that setting. Um, but the but gradually um, people started to develop interactive theorem provers. So there was the work of there was Paul Abraham's PhD thesis, uh, Bledsoe and Gilbert um, started to um, become interested in this. There was even a found this nice flyer for a, a conference about formalizing Morse's uh, set theory in sort of uh, a more interactive setting. And then maybe the first really successful interactive prover as we know it today would be the SAM systems, SAM for semi-automated mathematics. These, th there was a whole sequence of SAMs, as you might guess, starting from SAM1 going up to at least SAM5. Uh, and it was quite successful in the sense that it was even used to settle an open problem in lattice theory, which was quite a breakthrough at the time. And that breakthrough was a success for the human computer combination because the computer automatically came up with a certain lemma and the human recognized that that implied um, the validity of this conjecture. I think it was due to, to Bumcrod or somebody like that. I, I don't know the details. And then eventually in the uh, mid to late 60s and early 70s, we got the three major interactive theorem provers that I think have more or less given rise to most of the work today, Automath, Misa, and LCF. So these were all developed for very different motivations, but all of them, to some extent, were trying explicitly to be interactive theorem provers or proof checkers, not fully automated theorem provers. Uh, for example, Robin Milner, who, who implemented LCF, um, wrote the following in an, in an interview uh, talking about his early work in theorem proving that led to LCF. I wrote an automatic theorem prover in Swansea for myself and became shattered with the difficulty of doing anything interesting. Uh, in other words, he um, was interested in principle in the idea of, of automation, but ultimately decided interaction was a more productive approach. So we have perhaps what might look like a slightly paradoxical history where people dove straight into automated theorem proving first and only belatedly started to discover the merits of doing things more interactively. And I think a lot of the subsequent decades have been perhaps a kind of rapprochement between these two techniques, like learning to do automated theorem proving subject to user control or make low-level interactive theorem proving less painful by including more automated techniques. And I still don't think by any means we've reached the um, the perfect combination. But as I said at the beginning, my claim is that at least as important as developments in theorem proving techniques is just the quality of the mathematical libraries of results. Um, Anyone who's formalized any mathematical result will, has probably had the experience that at some point you seem to hit a painful regress where you, know, you just want to assume some basic result that everyone knows. And, you know, it might be, you know, known to every school student, high school student, or every mathematics undergraduate. It's just, you know, common knowledge or it's obvious. But there can be this painful spiral if you try to formalize a non-trivial theorem of just always ending up discovering, oh, if you need to prove this, you first need this foundational result, and then to prove that, you need this foundational result. And you rapidly end up um, in, well, not quite an infinite regress, but quite a, a slow and painful regress. So if you or somebody else has already proved all these things in advance, it really makes, a, I, I would say, a dramatic difference. So, I mean... To slightly exaggerate, I'm sort of presenting the, the thesis that, you know, mostly formalizing the proofs in mathematical textbooks or papers is fairly trivial. What's difficult is just um, providing all the assumptions, clarifying all the hypotheses on which they depend. 
So how how um, what kind of theorems go in libraries? Well, there's always a temptation, you know, to to kind of show off by proving beautiful results or you know cute results or elegant results. You know, the Picard theorems in complex analysis. But the kind of theorems that are useful are often ones that don't seem very exciting, but just get used all the time in applications, like, for example, the change of variables formula for integrals. It's not, I think, the kind of theorem that has a, you know, is named after anybody, but you know, things like this are just fundamentally important to doing a lot of applications in certain domains. And why do people develop these libraries? Well, very often it is with some large goal in view. So, for example, two very big mathematical formalizations have been the the odd order theorem, which motivated a lot of the development of the mathematical component library in Koch, and then the Flyspec project, which was was mentioned uh, earlier in the introduction. Uh, which was to formalize the proof of the Kepler conjecture. That, in its turn, has motivated a lot of developments of my theor theorem proof, a whole light. And even though that these were developed with some particular application in view, my claim is that very often, if the libraries are done right, there's quite a good chance that they'll be helpful in other applications. And the, the main part of my talk at the end is sort of showing that that is or is not true of of, uh, of the isoparametric theorem. So if you look at the history, I think it's true to say the first really large formal mathematical library was developed in the Mesar system. It's called the Mesar Mathematical Library. That one was developed stylistically very much as a formalization of existing mathematics. So more or less, they took a certain standard textbook. For example, they, they took the textbook, um, uh, like a compendium of continuous lattices, one of these standard textbooks on lattice theory, and essentially just systematically formalized the, the theorems in it one at a time. Um, so it was a very bottom-up kind of process and very familiar to the working mathematician. Whereas these other formalizations have been more driven in a, in a top-down way. You want this application at the end. What do we need to do to, to make that feasible? And if you look at uh, all the sort of leading theorem provers, they have pretty large and ever-growing um, mathematical libraries. Uh, you know, at, at the very least, Koch, Hollide, Isabel Hall, and Lean all have very big libraries as well, and probably many other theorem provers too. Um, I'm not actually quite sure which is the biggest, but I think it might be Isabel, Archive of Formal Proofs or Koch, uh, but perhaps Lean has now overtaken them. I, I don't know. But either way, there's, there is now a lot more than there was in 1990, I'd say that much. And so to distill all the motivational stuff, uh, why do you develop these libraries? It may be just by need, you need some particular definitions or lemmas to support some more interesting thing in formal verification or doing a formalized mathematics. You might be consciously developing foundations so that even though you do have an overall application in mind, you still try to develop it in the most general setting you can with the view that it might be useful in other ways, like the, the measure theory in Euclidean space that was developed for Flyspec. In my case, at least, it's often just motivated by curiosity, you know, as the theorem prover developer, how well does this work? Is it problematic? Do I need to fix something in the theorem prover to, to make it easier? Um, or it's just a very good way of understanding mathematics more carefully. Uh, so I've certainly found that when I read mathematics in the normal sense, I tend to be very slipshod and I'll sort of read an argument and say, yeah, I kind of understand it. And, you know, the, it, it's a common experience that, you know, you think you understand mathematics, um, but if you try teaching it, for example, um, you discover you need to understand it on a much deeper level. And if you need to teach it to a computer, uh, typically you need to understand it in a still more concrete and um, precise way. And, and sometimes really clarified in quite interesting ways as a result.
And also, I think there tends to be just a kind of completionism. So I've also found I set out to develop things with <clears throat> with some application in mind, but at some point, completionism takes over, and you think, right, you know, I'm going to look at you know twenty different textbooks and see what they all say in this area, and I'll you know if I see any interesting lemma, I'll try to prove it. Um, just because you have this satisfying feeling that you're really rounding out and completing things. Uh, so in particular, if I look at the whole light library, I think it's been a combination of all of these motivations. And I actually think that the best organized mathematical libraries are often motivated by a combination of, of different motivations. If it's just driven by applications, it's very often too ad hoc and limited and specialized. If it's just driven by, um, let me develop background theory without any particular application in view, uh, very often you discover things that are wrong, as I'll, I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so if you do just develop a library, uh, what can go wrong? You, know, you might prove some apparently useful looking lemma only to discover you know, the hypotheses you actually need for your application are weaker, and so it's not directly useful at all. Or even if the hypotheses do hold, it would have been nicer if you'd proved the theorem with a more economical list of hypotheses, because now every time you apply that library theorem, you have to discharge those hypotheses. And, you know, to a human, you might say, well, it's obvious, but if you have to do some non-trivial work every time, um, that can become a significant load. It's also quite common to have mismatches or degenerate cases wrong. You know, you, you forget the case n equals zero, you forget the case of the empty set and so on. Um, and by doing that, you can even make your lemmas, which apparently look quite interesting, uh, turn out to be vacuous or even, even axioms can be, you know, vacuous or contradictory if you're just a little bit careless. Um, so for example, I've seen one axiomatization of real analysis where one of the axioms was um, every bounded set of uh, reals has a least upper bound, um, which looks all, all awfully plausible. And you can probably read it in a bunch of analysis books. Uh, but of course, it needs to be every non-empty bounded set. <laughs> silly little things like that. Or, or to a mathematician, silly little things um, that can vitiate a whole formal development. So my, my general rule of thumb, which I found certainly applies to my own work, is if you haven't used a library for some non-trivial application, then there's probably something wrong with it. It's probably um, not organized as well as it could be. And possibly there's even something wrong with the basic definitions that will only become apparent uh, when you try something non-trivial with it. Okay, so having talked generalities a lot, I want to now talk about one particular example, which is the isoparametric theorem. Part of the reason I want to talk about this is because it's pretty much the most recent thing that I formalized in pure mathematics, like at the end of last year. Um, and I actually found it a surprising struggle fitting it to what was in the libraries. And in some ways, it was quite a frustrating experience. So what was my original motivation for proving this result at all? Well, to be honest, it was <laughs> <good>. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so Frank Biedijk's been, been tracking this, the, this uh, list of 100 great theorems and how many have been formalized in different systems. And before I did this, it was 98%. <laughs> and I wanted to get it to 99%. <laughs> I, I, I'll leave it to, um, I don't know, uh, Kevin Buzzard or possibly to future generations to get it to 100%. But I, I, I was satisfied with just getting it because the last one is Fermat's last theorem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So this, this, of course, is rather a silly motivation, but um, if you just formalize theorems because they're on this list, again, there's a tendency of doing things in an ad hoc way. 
But what I kind of hoped was that I've now got such a well-developed library of lots of things in whole life that I wouldn't necessarily need to do much library development and I wouldn't need to do the proof in an artificial way. And, uh, well, perhaps how wrong I was. So, so the statement or the sort of classical statement people are probably familiar with. I mean, you can state it in certain different ways. It's basically saying that out of all simple, uh, rectifiable closed curves, then the circle encloses the largest area and strictly the largest in the sense that if you meet the bound, it must be a circle. So this is the statement in, in Osserman's paper, which uh, I'll come back to, to later. So the circle is uniquely characterized by the property of all simple closed plane curves of length L. The circle of circumference L um, encloses the maximum area, and this is that area, 4 pi, uh, L squared over 4 pi. So what does the final statement look like in my theorem proof a whole light. So this is how it looks on, on Frake's list. Um, I'm going to show these things in their, their ASCII syntax in the hope that they're not too unreadable, but I'll talk you through some of the weird syntax. The exclamation mark in particular is the for all quantifier. So that's just saying for all lengths L and for all curves G. And this is just the logical and, and this is the logical implication, and this is logical exists, the question mark. So the statement, I think, is quite close to just a natural formalization of what you'd want it to be. It's saying, assume that G is a rectifiable, simple path curve, just terminology, um, and it's closed. That is, the, fin the end of the path is the same as the beginning of the path, so it loops around on itself, but doesn't otherwise self-intersect. Then measure of the inside of the path image is bounded by, you know, L squared over four pi. And what's more, if you meet the bound, then in fact, the path image is a circle. It maybe looks a bit unintuitive to write sphere here, but this is all in two dimensional space. So it, it means the sort of one dimensional sphere in two dimensional space, I, I a circle. So, so that's the statement. So let me unpack some of the definitions. Well, most of them are pretty standard notions, path, simple path, rectifiable, length. And one good thing about the libraries was that all the concepts I needed to at least state the theorem were previously formalized. So if you look at the concepts used, it's rectifiable path, simple path, path finish and end, length, measure, and path image, and this notion of inside, which I'll explain in a moment. But it's all absolutely standard, the sort of thing you see in any topology or analysis book. A path is basically just a, func a continuous function out of some arbitrary parameterizing interval, minor all zero, one, except that for type reasons, which I won't bore you with, it's considered as a so the vector zero and the vector one, just because it, it happens to fit in with the way certain other theorems are written. So instead of literally a mapping out of the reals, it's a mapping of the reals Cartesian product size one, but that's of no uh, mathematical significance. So to be a path is just to be a continuous function out of that interval. To be a rectifiable path is that it's not only a path, but it has bounded variation. And the length is, again, just the standard concept of variation from calculus. Um, you know, of course, these definitions like has bounded variation on vector variation, they in turn unpack to other calculus type definitions. And all of this was initially just developed to support fly spec. There was enough integration theory to support all those things. So all those sorts of things are very standard. And the sim I don't show simple curve because it's a bit longer, but it's basically straightforward saying that the curve doesn't cross itself except at the endpoints. This notion of inside, however, is a little more interesting. If you look at the statement, it's talking about the measure of the inside of the path image. So what does inside mean in this setting? It's not the same thing as interior. That's a quite different uh, topological concept. Um, rather, it's talking about 
the area enclosed by a set. In other words, um, intuitively, if you think of, of, of the set as a kind of barrier in the plane, um, which points are kind of trapped inside that barrier and can't get to infinity. In other words, more precisely, it's the union of the bounded components of the set's complement. So this, I think, is not a standard definition that everyone would understand, so I just wanted to be quite explicit about that one. You don't, of course, actually need to introduce a, a function for this, um, nor does it need to be as general as this because we're in the very special setting of a simple closed curve. But the nice thing about this one is that it, it has some quite nice properties in itself and you can apply it to, to arbitrary uh, sets. Uh, for example, um, in the existing Hull Light libraries, there's an n-dimensional version of the Jordan curve theorem stated in terms of this inside and outside concept outside being the union of all the unbounded components of the complement. And it gives what I think is quite a nice intuitive statement of uh, of the generalized n-dimensional Jordan curve theorem. Namely, if S is some set in n-dimensional space, which is homeomorphic to the sphere, um, which in the two-dimensional case means basically it's a simple closed loop. Um, then the inside is a non-empty open connected set. The outside is also a non-empty open connected set. The inside is bounded. The outside is unbounded. The inside and the outside don't intersect. The union of the inside and the outside is the complement of the, the, the set. And both the inside and the outside have the original set as the frontier that is boundary, topologically, topological boundary. So although, the, although this inside-outside concept isn't, I think, a, a standard thing, it's, I, I would argue, quite natural. And so it's, it's used in the statement. So, so much for the statement. Um, what, what about the proof? So if you, if you look at a lot of uh, proofs of the isoparametric theorem, they often start with some fairly convincing argument that you really only need to consider a convex curve. When I say a convex curve, of course, I mean the area enclosed by the curve is convex. Um, and, and the argument is quite a simple one um, intuitively. You know, if you have some other curve K, then basically all you need to do is smooth out the, the dents in it with, with line segments and turn it into its convex hull. And it's rather obvious that you can only grow uh, the area by doing that and also that you can only shrink the length of the curve because, for example, getting from here to here, the shortest point is a straight line not going around the original curve. Now, now that, that uh, of course, is true and is kind of obvious. And so the first disappointment of this formalization was that uh, proving it was not so obvious. <laughs> uh, so part of the, well, I suppose the problem is that uh, this, uh, this picture creates the artificially simple impression that you only need to do this finitely many times. <laughs> <laughs> but the trouble is just being rectifiable does not imply that there can only be finitely many wiggles. There can actually be a countable infinity of dents in the curve. So you need a limit argument. I mean, it is basically the same as this. It's just extremely horrible because you need to state it explicitly as a limit. So more to shock you than in the hope of anyone understanding it. I'll show you a little bit from the middle of the proof. Um, basically, it's defining some countable family of, 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 of curves H where the n plus oneth curve is sort of smoothing out one more bit of the nth curve. And then, of course, you need to have an argument that there is actually a limit and blah, blah, blah. It's a bit, it's a bit painful. But anyway, it, it was possible. So the end result, at least, doesn't... How many lines? Long. Sorry? How many lines was that one picture? Oh, uh, I'll have to check, but... Um, <coughs> certainly hundreds. Yeah, certainly hundreds. I, I'll... I'll uh, I, yeah, ballpark figure. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to actually pull up the proof and count them, but uh, I, I can do that uh, perhaps in the question and answer session or, or afterwards, but it's certainly hundreds. 
I mean, I, I can very quickly uh, so the entire proof of the isoparametric theorem is 4,000 lines, so this is part of it, so, and it's a non-trivial part, so let's say 1,000 as a, as a ballpark figure. So a picture paints 1,000 lines. <laughs> it does. Exactly, 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 the, the proverb is, is almost right. Especially a faulty picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, having done that, um, we do at least have this reduction to the convex case. In other words, if we start with any rectifiable simple closed path where the inside is not convex, then we can find another one, H, which blah, 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 is convex and has the same convex hull and the length is no bigger. Um, and the area inside is strictly greater. So that, that's all fine. So having got to the case of convex sets, um, it's now tempting to think that the result might be easy. I, I had my hopes because the whole light library already had a result called the Brun-Minkowski theorem uh, in n dimensions which looks awfully close to proving this for convex sets or, or sort of generally sets with a nice simple shape. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I Googled for some mathematical blog and they give what is a reasonably um, correct, I think, proof of the isoparametric theorem using the brun minkowski theorem, you know, just in a page uh, at most. I, I don't want to, to go into um, the details. Let me first show you what the whole light brun minkowski theorem says, and then why it turns out not to be so easy. Uh, the Brun-Minkowski theorem is basically about the measure of these kind of, uh, I think they usually call Hausdorff sums. In other words, you have two sets, S and T, and you consider the set in, these are vectors in n-dimensional space, and you take the set of all sums where X is taken from S and Y is taken in T. And the Brun-Minkowski theorem is about the measure of that sum set. And it basically says that the nth root, where n is your dimension, of that measure is at least the nth root of the measure of s plus the nth root of the measure of t. And it turns out there's a fairly simple path from that to the isoparametric theorem, which is basically this. The only trouble is that the notion of the length of a curve that you get out of it is basically this limit. I don't know if this is readable. It's basically it's basically the limit of what the area would be, uh, so to speak, with radius t versus, so, sorry, radius r versus radius r plus t divided by t. You know, you sort of think of it like that, that type of thing. And using Brun Minkowski, there's now a quite simple argument. But unfortunately, this notion of length is not, is a more, I suppose, it's a quite distinct notion from my you know, standard variation of a, a rectifiable curve notion. So it does not seem at all easy to actually relate, um, you know, length as a limit of area differences to length of a rectifiable path. And now, now you might argue this is a sign perhaps that what I should have done is develop more general, you know, mixed areas, Hausdorff measures, some other thing. And that's probably true. But since I didn't, I needed to look in another direction, otherwise start on another formalization project. So having reduced to the convex case, there's also another proof, which is, I mean, historically also very interesting and quite simple looking, um, which is Steiner's hinge argument. So this starts by imagining that you have a, um, a curve that encloses um, an area and it's not a circle. You, you start by dividing it a, along a line of symmetry base or, or a, a, a line that splits the length into something like that. So you can sort of reduce it to half of the, the problem. And then you, you sort of need to start considering the length of the, the area of sets like the, the sort of semicircular um, thing where you, you have sort of half of your convex shape uh, cut across by a sort of a diameter. And Steiner's hinge argument is, is quite nice actually it simply observes if your shape is not a circle then it's fairly easy to see by a bit of elementary coordinate geometry that that's the same thing as that not being a right angle 
So all you need to do to make something which encloses a, um, a bigger area is to sort of push this out. In other words, you sort of imagine perhaps moving this point here along the axis here and hinging it about this point until it becomes a right angle. And then again, by a bit of elementary um, reasoning, you can see these two bits, these two sort of add-on bits have just been rotated, so they haven't changed the area. But um, you know, if you figure out what the area of the triangle is, it's maximal when um, it's a right angle. So you can argue if you have a shape that's not a circle, you could make the area bigger. And that was basically the, the foundation of Steiner's first proof or so-called proof of the parametric theorem. The, the, the trouble was, however, Steiner famously overlooked that that doesn't actually prove there is a curve with maximal area. You know, he proves if you start with one that isn't a circle, you can get a bigger one, but he hasn't actually proved that there's any, any you know, any limit. So that's not in itself, however, that difficult to do. And again, that was something I could do using the whole li libraries, and it wasn't too difficult proving that there is a, a curve that encloses the maximal area. The way I did it was to use the this Arzella Ascoli kind of completeness of a function space or a very special case of it, um, basically saying if you have a sort of a sort of uniformly Lipschitz connection of functions, then you can find a subsequence of, of it, which converges. And, and therefore you can argue if you just keep up this process of, you know, going bigger and bigger, um, there's actually a, a subsequence with a, with a limit and that will be the maximum. Uh, I, I won't go into details, but anyway, that in itself was not, not a problem. What slightly surprisingly turned out to be a problem was just formalizing again, this very, straightforward looking geometric argument you know you have this triangle with two blobs attached to the outside all you have to do is you know rotate it a bit keep the blobs as they are possibly because of my own mental deficiencies i seemed to do an incredibly bad job of that and eventually became quite discouraged um like a lot of these geometric theorems it looks so much easier when you don't formalize it um because the the everyday intuition has so much um, stuff about configurations and area, and you can you know manipulate things without changing the orientation of this, that, and the other. It's quite hard to prove that formally, and my discouragement reached its maximum when I actually discovered um, that actually my first the argument as I first understood it from naive uh, presentations in books is actually faulty because actually the process of doing this hinging can actually make part of one of these blobs drop below the line of symmetry. That's not mentioned everywhere, although it is mentioned by um, Siegel in his his paper. So he, you know, he, uh, like a good mathematician says, there are several ways to fix this problem. Details are left. Um, so the way I was going to do it was um, to use a sort of epsilon move, and uh, you can you can do it, but somehow I just got so depressed by the whole business that I decided to throw that away and start again. And so I totally, I switched to a totally different analytic proof um, following Osserman's paper. Osserman is the one where I showed the, the statement from, if you want to find the paper, it has the, the details there. And he essentially proves it by calculus, more or less. So he says, let's suppose we have a, you know, a curve in the plane, well, just by the standard formula for the length of a parameterized curve, the length is this. And using a very special case of Green's theorem, you can see that the area is also a line integral. Um, and if you choose the parameter right anyway, you can basically just do it as a simple calculus inequality. And it's not very, it, it's quite intuitively comprehensible, not very difficult. And it all comes down to just proving this inequality for this particular kind of function, which is commonly known as, as Vertinger's inequality. Um, and so to formalize this, uh, which did become the foundation of the eventual proof, we needed first to have the integral-based formula for arc length. Well, that was already formalized. 
So that was fine. I needed the integral formula for area. Unfortunately, Hull Light had nothing whatsoever like that. No real differential geometry, no, you know, no Green's theorem or anything like that. And then I had to uh, do a proof of Vertinger's inequality, which didn't previously exist, but is not too difficult. What's more, I don't want to assume the curve is smooth. My hypothesis was only that it's rectifiable, that is, it has bounded variation. So that implies, among other things, it's differentiable except on a set of measure zero, but it certainly does not imply that it's differentiable everywhere, let alone smooth. So on the face of it, um, I couldn't use Osserman's proof, but via fairly mechanical generalization, it does actually turn out to work. Um, and to see what the generalization is, uh, I'll, I'll just show you Vertinger's um, inequality itself, as proved in Hardy, Littlewood, and Polly's inequality book. This is basically their statement. Um, you know, if y has period 2 pi, the derivative y prime is, is in L2, so it's square integrable, and this is true, then this inequality holds with it equality if and only if it's of this form. Now, when you read this, you might be tempted to assume Hardy, Littlewood, and Polly are assuming differentiability, but actually they're not. Um, so where they superficially appear to be talking about derivatives, they're actually effectively talking about antiderivatives. So they're not saying y prime is the derivative of y, they're rather saying y is the antiderivative of y prime, if you like. And so by formalizing it in that sense, it you could just follow the proof from Hardy, Littlewood, and Polya. And it's a bit long, but um, this is what it looks like. It's a bit, bit ugly. But notice that the key hypothesis is not saying anything about differentiability. It's saying that basically f has f prime has integral f. In other words, f is the indefinite integral of f prime. And the proof of this is not too hard, but it did need me to generalize some existing calculus lemmas, like like integration by parts, which were assuming too much differentiability. And it turned out to be very useful that the whole light libraries did have a good theory about absolute continuity. So absolute continuity is, is perhaps slightly obscure if you're not into integration and measure theory, but being absolutely continuous roughly means it is an antiderivative, a, a Lebesgue antiderivative. <clears throat> uh, one possible characterization is the banach zaretsky theorem, which says f is absolutely continuous if it's continuous, has bounded variation, and maps sets of measure zero to sets of measure zero. And that already existed in whole light. And by using some basic lemmas about absolute continuity, all of the calculus I needed to do Vertinger generalized. Uh, for example, yeah, I'm already getting a little close to time, so I'll, I'll skip over this. But the calculus effectively generalizes. So everywhere you intuitively think f prime is the derivative of f, it usually means something more like f prime is the derivative of f almost everywhere, and f is absolutely continuous, or looked at another way, f is the antiderivative of f prime. And it turns out that not only Vertinger, but the entire proof generalizes pretty straightforwardly to that setting. And so finally, I just need to prove this area integral, which is a very, very special case of Green's theorem. Um, you know, I prove it only for a convex set, I prove it only for a convex set that's been perfectly aligned along a diameter with some particularly convenient parameterization where the parameterization itself is absolutely continuous. So in that sense, it's extremely special. But on the other hand, it's not assuming any differentiability properties besides um, differentiability almost everywhere, on, except on a set of measure zero. And that's enough to make the whole awesome and type proof generalize very mechanically. And so the overall proof is just, you know, you pick your coordinate axes so that it meets this special Green's theorem. You reparameterize the curve by arc length. That's a Lipschitz parameterization, so it is absolutely continuous. That, that's a basic lemma, that absolute continuity. And then you just follow the analytic proof in Osserman using uh, Vertinger's lemma generalized. And we get the, the end result. There we are. So... And indeed, now, when you sort of look at things in the cold light of day, you could get rid of a lot of the hypotheses, right? In particular, because of this very general notion of inside, 
we probably don't actually need the curve to be simple. I mean, this would still be true if it crosses itself. But to do that, I would also have to generalize the Green's theorem. Um, and for that matter, the fact that it's closed doesn't matter either, because if it's, you know, if it's just an arc, it will not enclose anything. So it's degenerately true. But yeah. anyway, it's already, um, it's already, I think, a pretty natural statement of how, how the the statement is formally understood. I admit that Osman never explicitly said rectifiable, but I think when he says, you know, has length L, that's sort of implicit. So what do we conclude? The good side is all the definitions were already there in the whole light library. I didn't have to develop any of these just for this application. No definition, no definition was developed for the making of this, this theorem. It would, however, have been much easier to do the proof if there'd been more differential geometry or just some more general, you know, maybe Hausdorff measure or something. I'm not even sure exactly what would have made it most easy, but some more intrinsic definition of the length of a, uh, the boundary of a, a shape in two dimensional space. And if I look at what motivated the ingredients of the proof, flyspec is the number one. A lot of this stuff is just integration theory developed for flyspec. But a lot of the stuff, like in particular, all the stuff about absolute continuity, um, I developed just because I got interested in the concept. Um, like I remember when I first looked at this, it just seemed so obvious that if a function is, you know, differentiable almost everywhere, um, then the integral of that um, is going to exist and be equal to the original function. But no, um, there are these pathological examples where it isn't true, like like this uh, devil staircase function. So so I, I just got interested in absolute continuity. But until this point, I don't believe I've ever actually used it for anything. So it was nice, nice to do that. And as with almost every non-trivial application, there were a lot of cases where basic calculus type results needed to be generalized. You know, I already had integration by parts, but I had the integration by parts that I learned at high school, more or less, where everything's differentiable. So if you want to generalize it to, you know, differentiable almost everywhere. It's, it, it requires some work. But as a result, the libraries have become more general, and maybe that'll be useful in the future. And so a mixed picture. Um, but anyway, I will say I was very happy to get it over the line. And that is the end of my talk. So thank you. <laughs>